3D printing is an exciting prospect to many. The idea that you can produce almost anything in your own home by the use of a single machine feels like something straight out of Star Trek, even if the reality is much less grandiose. The Aquila S2 3D printer from Voxlab is a filament-based 3D printer that can reach incredibly high temperatures, both in its hot point and on the heated and textured bed. But do those features mean that this is one of the best printers that you will find in this price range? I'm William Worrell with MakeUseOf.com, and today we'll be taking a deep dive into the Voxlab Aquila S2 FDM 3D printer. This is a self-assembly 3D printer that also comes with a spare nozzle for the extruder, a stand for your filament, some filament to test the device with, and some general tools such as a scraper and needle. It also comes with an SD card and an SD card reader. Now, the SD card has a few test prints that you can run once the device is all put together, if you want to get a good idea of the sort of thing that it is capable of. However, the SD card reader is a bit interesting. After a few reads it stopped working, and in the end I've mostly just had to avoid using it. You'll receive some very simple instructions to build the device, and each piece is carefully labelled, so you can be pretty confident that you're getting everything just right. All in all, it took just over an hour to put this thing together, so as long as you've got some experience playing with Meccano or Kinex in your past, then you'll probably get it together without too much concern. Once it is put together, it's simply a case of inserting the SD card with your patterns on, and it's pretty much ready to print. Some of the key features that make the Aquila S2 so appealing include its ability to work at insanely high temperatures, the fact that it includes a direct drive extruder, and that it also includes a magnetically attached removable build plate that features both a rough and smooth sides. Effectively, the smooth side is there if you'd prefer your prints to have a smooth base, while the textured side provides better adhesion if you're printing something that is going to struggle to stay attached to the printing base. This works mostly well, assuming that you keep external forces from interfering with your print. Although there were test prints on offer, our first port of call was this tiny Charmander, because… why not? This was literally our first print, both with this machine in particular, and with 3D printing in general, and the results are pretty decent. We also printed off this test pattern that was included with the machine, with some pretty great results. One of the most interesting things about this printer is its ability to handle a wide variety of different materials. The hot point goes up to really high temperatures, so you can do anything from a carbon filter PLA to smooth materials like a silk PLA or nylon, and the nozzle and bed will handle these with great ease. The only minor point that you should watch out for is that the bed can take a little while to heat up. It's not too bad for me because I'm based in the UK and our power standard is 230 volts. However, if you're living in the US or somewhere else with 120 volts, it's going to take a lot longer to warm up both the bed and the hot point. On the note of power, you can at least be sure that you'll be able to use this printer no matter where in the world that you happen to be based. The power supply has variable voltage thanks to this switch on the back of the printer, so if you're living in the US, you can switch to the lower voltage and not have to worry that this machine is about to explode or anything like that. Before we dive deeper into the actual printing, it's important to take a look at the software of the printer. The firmware has been updated since the end of last year, and you can see that on the device. When you're loading new filament, the older version of the firmware showed a Bowden-style extruder setup, but now it shows the appropriate image of a direct drive extruder, which is much better. Other than that, the firmware mostly functions relatively well, even if it is slightly clunky to navigate through the menus at times. The only major downside to the firmware is that while it does have presets for PLA and ABS, the only way to use filaments other than these is to manually set the preheating temperatures for yourself. There's not even a way of adding new presets, although you can edit the PLA and ABS presets to different bed and hot point temperatures. Hopefully with future updates, they'll make it possible to completely edit preheating profiles and to add your own in case you want to regularly use something like a flexible filament. Moving on to the actual printing outside of the first few test prints, the texture bed has been really helpful when dealing with basic PLA, and it also comes in really handy when we're using things like silk PLA, which can struggle to adhere properly. If you have a preference for using an adhesive, you can always swap to the smooth side of the bed and use hairspray or glue to keep your print attached properly, but for the most part, the textured bed alone does a decent job. We've printed several different figures, models, and especially a fair amount of usable prints. For example, we managed to produce several stands for some relatively chunky gaming systems, and these have mostly worked quite well. The only issue we ever encountered was when using rafts that would sometimes be hard to remove completely, but they could potentially be fixed by changing some settings. Having said that, 
Rafts really aren't that necessary with this machine. The bed is heated and textured, so you don't really need to use them. Brims will work just as well, and they don't get badly stuck to your prints when they're finished. As you can see, we managed to get a decent level of detail in a lot of these prints. The Usagi feature has a lot of fine details, and they've mostly come out quite well. On some prints, we did have a bit of stringing. For instance, on the Game Boy Advanced SP logo here, you can see that some letters are connected where they're not supposed to be, but that's easily fixable with a file or sandpaper. Some of the best results we had were actually from the black silk PLA, which resulted in a very glossy finish on this trinket dish, and a slightly less glossy finish on this Game Boy Color stand. We also did try some stranger filaments, such as this wood PLA. This was less successful, but that's almost certainly to do with this filament having pretty narrow requirements when it comes to printing with it. We tried to produce a wooden egg, and unfortunately it was very stringy and mostly fell straight apart. Again, this is probably nothing to do with the printer itself, and more to do with this being a particularly finickety material to work with in the first place. We've covered a relatively broad number of features and different print and material types. However, there are a couple of minor negative points that we probably want to cover here. Firstly, the build volume is aggressively average. It comes in at 220mm by 220mm by 240mm, which is plenty of room for a lot of prints, but is still slightly under similar devices like the Creality Ender 3. The other negative point is that it doesn't come with an automatic levelling system. That's not much of a shock for this sort of price range, but it can be a bit tough if this is going to be your first machine, and you're not confident in levelling yourself. You can upgrade the machine with a levelling system of course, but it's still an important factor to be aware of. The all important question is whether or not the Aquila S2 is worth investing your money in. This machine will run you around 280 US dollars, which is pretty cheap for a machine that has this sort of feature set. While there are other printers that come in cheaper, they almost certainly won't perform as well as this one right here does. With the reversible build plate, the ability to handle an overwhelming variety of different filaments, and how easy it is to get this thing up and running, there's almost no other printer on the market that will serve you as well as the Aquila S2, assuming that you don't want to try and print something larger than your head. Thanks for watching our review of the Aquila S2 3D printer, and a big thanks to the team at Voxlab for sending us this product to cover. If you enjoyed the video, please leave it a like, because it really does help it to grow. And if you want to see more videos from us, hit the subscribe and bell icons down below to have our latest video sent directly to your inbox. If you're interested, you can also find the links in our description, which will lead to our website, where you'll find plenty of tech-based news, guides and features, as well as the written version of this review.